Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us this evening for another in our series of EdPuzzle Live events. We are so excited that you're here and grateful that you've chosen to spend the time with us as we continue our mission to spotlight and share inspirational and innovative instructional ideas. Um, please take some time to tell everyone a bit about yourself because our chat's open. So while you're settling in, I'm Stephanie from the EdPuzzle community team and my co-host today is another member of our team, the very lovely and talented Sarah Eiler. We've also got the always magnificent Kate Hodges behind the scenes. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Kate. Hey, everybody. Super excited to be involved in today's amazing live event focused on podcasting. I'm sure that many of us listen to educational podcasts, educators talking about education-y things. Um, how many of us, though, listen to podcasts created by students? Dr. Raina Friedman has been helping students produce podcasts for years, five to be exact, mm -hmm. and we're lucky enough to have her here with us today to share her story, her process, her advice, and a golden nugget of a template. Yeah. Raina is a fifth grade teacher at the Jordan Jackson Elementary School in Mansfield, Massachusetts, the past president of statewide organization MassQ, and an advocate for student agency and the power of building relationships and community. Welcome, Raina. Hi. Hi, Raina. Hi. I feel like I'm in a living room chatting with friends. <laughs> I know. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in. We, okay, we have a lot of people judging for social media who really want like to hear your story and want to hear. So we are gonna like just jump right in. We're not wasting Perfect. time. No, so here we not. go, Raina. Ready? Yeah. Tell, tell us how you got started on your podcasting journey. All right. So if we could go to the next slide because that really kind of gives an overview of what I was thinking about, but. I wanted to figure out a way to like build in, in community and inspire and engage kids. And I'm always challenging my students to lead as humans and be a catalyst for change. And I'm always seeking ways for a global audience. And so about six years ago, the middle school asked our school if we could start using a vocabulary program called Worthy Wise. Was it a workbook? It is a workbook. Oh, and oh, so yay. You love, love me. I am not the workbook. <laughs> teacher. I try, I do do it if I have to. Right. So I happened to ask um, if I had to use it and said, if I don't have to use it, don't order it. And of course I came back in the fall and what was in my room, a box of workbooks. So mm -hmm. I called my principal down because he always said, Raina, don't just do things, ask first. And I said, <laughs> great. So I went down and I asked to meet with him and I asked him if I had to do the workbook cover to cover. And he said, where are you going with this? And I said, <laughs> Is it the goal for the kids to learn the words, learn how to use the workbook, or just do the workbook? And he said that obviously the goal is for them to become familiar with the exercises, but the end goal, as we know with good teaching and pedagogical practice, is for kids to use these vocabulary words. So I said, great, I want to start a podcast. They had been doing like a small podcast with our morning announcements, and I said, I want to bring it to the classroom. I think we could use the vocabulary words for this podcast. And so that's kind of where the idea stemmed from. So the kids would learn words and then have to put them in the podcast. And so that, if you go to the next slide... Okay. So yeah. So the kids are actually applying what they've learned. It's not a fill in the blanks. It's not a matching. They are actually taking what they've learned and putting it out into the world. Yes. And so I brought student voice live. And then if we go to the next slide, this is really where we get into kind of like the why, right? Like brace yourselves. The workshop are coming. That meme. No. Oh, the meme is so fun. I wanted to create this authentic experience that built community. And so what I started doing in year one was really researching different tools that we could use that were safe to use with kids. I decided that it was gonna be my account. I have parent permission for kids' first names only to go out somewhere, just not identifiable, you know, location and whatnot. So the kids are actually are never on the podcasting site. So, and I got permission from my family, my admin and the digital team. And then I spoke to colleagues across the country to see what they were using to figure this out. And then if you go to the next slide, I will go into the exact process. So this was actually student driven. So I didn't even have a name for this thing, none. I started blank. 
I had a group of kids. We talked about what we were going to do, why we were going to do it, what we were going to try using. And then I said, we need a podcast. And the kids actually came up. We brainstormed and in brainstorming, no idea. Every idea is a good idea. Got to bite your lips in time. And then we we voted like democratic process and we narrowed it down to two. It was the day in the life of a fifth grader or top 10 lists like Letterman used to do. Letterman used to do, yeah. Yeah. And so what the kids start and then they set up a class debate with pro con pro. So we're getting into all of these like public speaking skills with this. And I would like to remind our audience, these are fifth graders. Yes, fifth graders. Mm -hmm. So they realize that the top 10 list, they wouldn't be able to use enough vocabulary words. Mm -hmm. So these students designed a podcast about the day in their life. And what they figured out was that they had to look at, we decided to look at 30 words. So it was 15 words per topic in this book. So we looked at two topics of words. Then they had to synthesize them and come up with something that at least 15 to 20 of them had in common that they could write about, which is hard. It is hard. Yeah. So, but they did this all on your own. So you're did this with you're guidance. Certain. I mean, we're talking about, I didn't even know what I was doing yet. Right. Like I, I was saying earlier to our Ed Puzzle friends that I actually nailed it during the pandemic. So it's definitely been a process. <laughs> so I think there's a question later on, right. About what didn't work. Yes. That part of yeah. that. So, yeah. So we actually ended up coming up with this and the kids have figured out that when they create their segment, that they can, they don't have to just stay in the classroom. They can go out and interview like the art teacher or the principal and we can find different recording spaces in our school. Like that was always a hard thing. So, you know, now there's some offices and extra space. So I'll call up the secretary. Is anyone using, you know, the, the team office? No. Okay. Can I send kids down to record? So it's really evolved, but that's kind of how I got started. And as far as the lessons I have learned on the journey If you are ever going to podcast with kids, don't make the mistake we made in year one of officially going live. We thought it would be really awesome if all the podcasts went one after the other. So I want you to imagine I had a computer at my desk with a microphone hooked up to it and the kids were in a long line through the room and had to be silent because you could even hear a crumbling of paper. Yeah. And it took several takes and really it was it was too much. So I have learned that you need to group them in groups of three to four kids. So you have podcast teams. We end up, if I do that last year, I had 23 kids. So we ended up with six episodes every time we went through Mm -hmm. for a total of like 40 something episodes by the time the year was done. And the kids all are working using the same 30 words, but what they come up with, you have to just trust them. I also learned, and I know you're going to give the nugget out, but it's so much better to organize in a slide deck. Yes. And yeah, we're going to, we're going to share that out with our audience. Raina has a great template that she gives out to her kiddos. So she's sharing her work with you. Yeah. So I've learned that. And then I really got into teaching them. And I know you're going to share a link about Eric Palmer's PV legs with how to publicly speak. He has, if you're not familiar with Eric Palmer, it's E-R-I-K and then Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R. He talks about poise, voice, life, eye contact, gestures, and speed. We obviously leave the gesture out until, unless we're doing like a video podcast, which is another level of this, but that's a great way to teach kids those public speaking skills in the common core. It really does. Yeah. Speaking yeah. and listening are common core standards. Yeah. Yes. So it, we, we do that as well. So you have to do that. And the kids actually have learned that listening to it a few times helps them get better. So they know that the first time they record, it doesn't have to be the end all be all. And I've also learned that you can do this over the phone during the pandemic. That's how I, we started with a lot of this refining. I actually called kids that wanted to do a podcast while we were shut down about being shut down. And so it does work over the phone with what, you know, various tools. Yeah. So there were a lot of lessons learned just by jumping in there because I think, and, and I, that, I think that's, magnificent because a lot of people are afraid to try something unless they know every little thing about it. And I guess what you modeled for the kids is we can all learn this together and we all yeah. learn this together. And yeah. Great. And then I'm going to ask her to go to slide eight so people can see something. Cause we, yeah. um, we settled with anchor and this actually tracks data. So you can actually see from two, I just shared from 2019 to 2022. Look, I mean, and I actually send this out on Twitter, Facebook, and 
through email and parents and guardians also share episodes. So therefore, I think a lot of this is family. But then if you go to the next slide, you can see the different episodes so we can track kind of the data. So you get into data collection and then did I put it in? Yes, the next one shows where in the world, like to be able to show a student, like yes, 97% of our listeners come from the United States. So we have somebody from Canada, Ireland, Costa Rica, and then to look at the different, where the podcasts are playing. And I, what love, the I love that you're sharing the data with them because yeah. even that could even turn into a math lesson. I mean, really, when you think about it, but that it does give them that sense, right? Yep. The world and is so, listening. Yeah. And when kids do write their podcast, they learn flow is important. They can use sketch noting as a visual thinking tool to be able to share what it is they want to say. Practicing is huge. They actually can record anywhere from three to five times. The first one they do is never the one they give me to put out there. Like I said, they can interview. They can even, um, I've had kids review products. So I'm hoping somebody will review Ed Puzzle this year. <laughs> but they do a whole tech product review for a podcast. And listening to it is huge. And then, like I said, sharing this data because they can see their reach this way. So why did you use Anchor? Why did the kids settle on that? Was it ease of use? Kid friendly? Why? It, we decided to do it. And I know one of the things people have asked is because they haven't necessarily signed a data privacy contract yet. But because it's my account with no kid information on it, that is why I am able to use it. But we actually settled on this because A, ease of use. Mm -hmm. B, it has tr like built-in music transitions for us to put in the beginning so we, uh, we don't have to deal with copyright stuff because it's already there. And there's unlimited episodes. And even though our episodes are short, I don't feel like I'm ever going to run out of room. And it's super easy to share. Okay, good. All right, good hits. When yeah. you're creating these podcasts, can the students be – logged into your account on multiple devices or are you just the one uploading it to anchor I'm nope, just i am the only one that is on anchor okay. they don't even know how to get in there okay cool yep so that's because my kids are under 13 if they were over 13 it might be a different story okay but my students are under 13 i really like to keep it as safe as possible while following mm -hmm. all the data privacy things yeah that we yeah. have to follow i mean i know some people use google sites and then mp3 so that way it just goes in a site mm -hmm. i like how anchor is set up with the different episodes and also with for me i wanted to track the data and yeah. to be able to share that with kids and families that it's not just like something i'm doing just for fun like there's a bigger story to tell and yeah. same that global piece of the data like that would be so cool as a student to know that like somebody in ireland listened to my podcast episode right. somebody in south africa mm -hmm. When I was in yeah. my life, like how when I was in the classroom, and if I tweeted out something that the kids did, they were like, "Someone liked it. Someone yeah. liked it. They or someone commented on it because yeah, it's out in the world for them." Well, to something too that does it didn't really come up when we met is like the EL population, right? I mean, talk about learning vocabulary, using vocabulary, hearing, speaking, listening, all of those skills that my EL teacher does. With I saw that somebody had asked yeah. that. Um, all of the things that my EL teacher does with kids, I was able to model through this experience. Okay. So speaking of experience, yes, we've been talking about it. We are going to listen to a very short, we're going to listen to one episode. It's under two minutes. So the kiddos, let's just set this up. The kiddos had vocabulary words and they, from their workbook, they didn't do a worksheet and they came up with a topic about natural disasters. So we're going to play this right now for you. Welcome to the day in the life of a fifth grader. I'm Ryan. I'm Ari. Today we're going to be talking about natural disasters. I'm Caroline. We are glad you've joined us. This, this podcast, podcast is sponsored, sponsored by our teacher, teacher Dr. Dr. Friedman. Natural disasters are a challenge across the nation from avalanches to blizzards. Natural disasters escalate the danger around people's homes and neighborhoods and can be meddlesome in, in people's lives. Previously, natural disasters have been really life risking and they still are. They have been getting better over the years thanks to scientists, but they are really still dangerous. A lot of people loathe natural disasters for a really good reason. Tornadoes can conquer over homes and lives, and they tend to go on a certain route. Natural disasters inflict great damage to other things, but we have ways to keep people safe and not to be roused by the storms. Natural disasters are 
usually monstrous storms that can usually cause a lot of damage. That is why they are called natural disasters. Natural disasters are getting worse at the summit of a mountain or a hill because it is higher up. That is why people say to stay away from mountains during disasters like tornadoes or blizzards. Hurricanes are very grim natural disasters. They can knock down houses and trees, etc. Hurricanes also catapult objects around the air. After all that happens, people are not that optimistic. This, this has been, been a day in the life, life of a fifth, fifth grader. grader. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Okay. I wish you could see a literal goosebumps. Like, that's my favorite line. People are not optimistic about natural disasters. But wow, they that is higher level thinking. Yeah, for and sure. it takes a couple weeks per episode. So from start to finish, it takes about five weeks to learn the words, write the episode and record it. And we end up, like I said, getting through anywhere from eight to ten, you know, vocabulary se- sections in the book. So we don't finish the book, but they learn how to use it. Okay. All right. So we're going to, so my next question for you is what other kinds of stories can kids tell? Um, And we might also drop in the link, which by the way, everyone, all, when this is uploaded to our YouTube channel tomorrow, we're going to, every link we mentioned today will be there. So don't panic, but we might also share out your template um, in the, in the comments, but really what other kinds of stories do you think can kids tell? What what are they? Yeah. So kids, you know, they gravitate towards personal stories, right? Like things they like, like movies or TV shows or books they've read, right? So some of them start with that like self. Mm -hmm. And then you have other kids who start looking at my community, problems in my community, solutions for that. Who can I talk to about that? Can I talk to the art teacher? Can I talk? We have a great um, local senator and house of representative. So they will be willing to come in and talk to the kids. Um, They can also talk about, I had kids reach out and think about the world, right? I mean, I had kids exploring the war in Ukraine. So current events. So really it's, it's, you know, when you think about good reading strategies with the text to text, text to self, text to world, text to media, that can all get connected into the podcasting world because they can, what kinds of stories can they tell? Anything. It's really up to them. It is up to them. Yeah. The occasion. It almost sounds like it's this natural evolution that they start right. with something and then they're like, oh, and there's all of a sudden also probably once they realize they have a global audience, they want to start addressing global concerns. Yes. And if people were listening, they would see that the only thing that I've provided, which will be in the template that we share, is the intro yes. and the conclusion. Um, I was actually out for six months on medical leave and my uh, sub, who's fantastic, came up with that idea and said, I wish that they kind of all started and finished the same. And she wasn't wrong. So it was helpful. And this really could be for any class, any content area. You could do a podcast for any content area, I'm pretty sure. Anything. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We will have... Yeah. And we will have all of the, we've got, if you stick in long enough, we've got a template, we've got a student podcasting starter pack for you that we're going to share out too. So we got, we got you covered fam. So, right. Oh, I see. Has it been world world yeah, it totally could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, in not only in English, but it could also be a translation. I imagine that's a good practical application yeah. of that. Sorry, my dryer. I apologize. <laughs> I think in the world language classroom, too, because I was a student of German in high school and college, you're doing a lot of those like situations like ordering at a cafe. So it could be the very similar things where you're using all of those new vocabulary words that students are learning and putting them into practice. And the fact that you are doing it in groups of three to four is perfect for any of those situations, right? Because you can have kind of that mimicking of the natural banter that will show your fluency in that foreign language. Yeah, um, and think about all the standards yeah. you're hitting, no matter what you teach, right? I mean, not just the speaking and listening, but the writing, the content area, depending on what they're speaking about. Okay, yeah. so uh, we've got a next question, Sarah. Of yep. course, we, as a, a video learning company, we have to ask how we can use video as a useful tool in podcasting. So I think vodcasting, right, is what we think that giving a face 
if you have permission and that would be you probably have to use something that has signed a data privacy agreement especially with the kids 13 and under but i think giving kids a face is huge allowing them to see themselves natural pause points being able to get animated i think you could, I, I wonder too with video if they get more animated because they see themselves mm -hmm. Yeah. They feel like they're on, like the newscaster. They feel like the meteorologist, you know, these real world experiences. I mean, my kids know who like some of the late night talk show hosts are. And some of them even know Saturday Night Live skits, which blows my mind when they start talking about things. And I'm like, how do you know that? You know, it's whatever their parents are, are, are watching. But I think video adds a whole other element because they are able to share their face and, and different things. They could even make props and things. And then I know that we had talked like with Edpuzzle, mm -hmm. there are these natural pause points. So if you're doing these, you know, you could think about as a student, where are the pause points in my own vodcast, which has got to be a higher level thinking skill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, where do I start? You know, it's like back in the day when you would let students maybe make a quiz and yep. then they get an understanding of what goes into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, yeah, start to add those pause points. Where is a good place to ask a question of your audience? Correct. Yes. And let me ask you, can you upload things to Edpuzzle for this? Well, you can. So I was actually thinking when you were saying pause points, um, it's a great opportunity for us to talk about our student project feature, which is um, you would create that activity for your students to complete, give a little bit of directions on Edpuzzle, and then they could upload their video and use those natural pause points and embed their own questions in those natural pause points and ask those questions of their classmates. Um, great opportunity too. You could do it as live mode on the screen at the front of the room and you could all, um, look at that podcast together <laughs> as a class um, to view it as a group. So really cool ways to, to use podcasting. And you said meteorology and I was like, oh, what if you used a green screen even and uploaded the green screen video? Right. right of the of the vodcast and then has your students answering those questions i mean I there's just, the opportunities are endless it's amazing i think there are probably also teachers who are probably hesitant to put out in the world but you could do the vodcasting with i, I love the peer-to-peer -peer learning with another classroom or the buddy grade you know you grade you you but you buddy up fifth grade with like 11th grade or something you know and and they're watching and giving feedback i think that's also possibly a good idea for those. And I know there are people like, I can't put it out in the world, so I can't do it. But yep. even doing it within a, a building or a district, I think is a good option too. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So people, this is your chance to ask your questions. I think, I think, I have to put on my cheaters. I think we have addressed them all, but I'm not sure. Oh, here we go. What's the motivation? Here we go. So what could be the motivation behind you in creating a podcast? Well, I know it depends who you're asking. Right. Mm -hmm. So for students, if you're looking for engaging, you know, being able to tell a, a kindergartner even that they can speak to the world. Imagine like think about the how empowering that is. Mm -hmm. You can make a difference and it could be something as simple as what's what do we need in our playground? Like or you can do it. Uh, we did, we, I did when I was an instructional coach, I worked with a kindergarten class and we made an, a, a book. We made an, an iBook, but it was the same. We recorded their voices. We didn't show their faces. And same thing. It was an iBook that people were downloading all over the world. It was free. So, yeah, I think it's that motivation to create that well, you're that that intrinsic, right? Like my kids are excited to do a vocabulary workbook because they know they are not taking a quiz or a test on these 30 words, but they're going to have to figure out a way to use them in a podcast. Yes, exactly. And, and I would argue that they probably have an e even deeper understanding of the words by applying them in creating a podcast. They oh, do. Sure. And in fact, they're teaching the adults because my art teacher has said to me, I've had to pause your kids when they're talking because when they ask me a question, and I don't know what the word is. They have to explain it. <laughs> or, um, my favorite was the um, our, our head of our cafeteria was being interviewed, which was so great. And she's like, we burst out laughing. I had to stop it and redo it because they asked me how I felt about the colony of kids coming in. She said, all I felt was it was like little ants coming in she's like and that was like my visual and I burst out laughing then they were laughing she's like and she you know she felt more connected right so there's another answer oh, to your you yeah. know your how to, what are we motivating we are not just motivating we're connecting humans through this podcast yeah 
That's what I do. Like. The hot, the, the podcast that I listen to definitely, I feel like the stories, especially, I always love a good, good story. Um, what's the craziest podcast subject the kids have come up with? Like, was there something that was just silly or goofy? Or well, no, no, they have to be school appropriate, right? So they're right. like all like focused on that. Yeah. I don't do they think have a blooper, any, do they have a blooper reel? It like oh do they God, have some do because they're well they're actually when they record it, they're recording it using a video tool mm -hmm. and then I export an MP3. So they love to show me the blooper reel and they mm -hmm. also love to show me in the background what kids weren't like paying attention. <laughs> because they forget, even though I'm getting the audio that they're sharing it, they strip it. Yeah. They um that I can see the video still if I wanted to. Well, we are going to share all of these links. Like I said, we'll share a link to a day in the life of a fifth grader podcast. So we do recommend that you share it with your students. Speaking of very quickly, do you have any podcasts that you, you have a listening station, correct? So I'm sure yeah, in, that's in, how in, I introduce yes. podcasting to my students. So I have um, three listening stations in my Google classroom. Mm -hmm. One is on TED Talks, which none of them knew what a TED Talk was this year. One is on podcasting and one is this website called um, Kids Should See This. But the podcasting one has what's um, the six minute podcast, which if you're not familiar with it, I highly suggest looking six into minute, it. Yeah, I just looked that up before. When families, when families say, what can I listen to on a long car ride? That's it. They love it. It's like a fictional story that's told over, I don't even know how many episodes, mm -hmm. but tons. And then they also listen to our podcast. So we actually analyzed what episodes kids you know talked about in our fifth grade and then we also have another one that's curated by age and subject okay good all right and we also have this list too in our infographic that we're going to share out with you so just stay stay tuned with us i want to take one last question from the audience reina from marguerite yep. Yep. my english three ap students just finished reading truman capote's in cold blood Ooh. would a book discussion much like a socratic seminar work with a podcast i don't see why not because i get to think right or act and that's kind of the best thing you can do mm -hmm. and a lot of podcasts out there are panel based too yeah. so you know set up a panel with your kiddos right and have them go back and forth with it especially with the socratic i think that's a great use of the socratic seminar for the 21st century so absolutely all right so Bye. why don't we we wanted to keep this short and sweet tonight not to you know not dismiss it but we also realize y'all have lives and people to put to bed too. So, um, My yes. so yes. thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Raina, for sharing your expertise and ideas with our audience. Um, be sure to follow Raina on social media and share her students podcast episode with your students. Um, we'd love to shout out that um, we will be joining Raina at the MassQ fall conference. So I'll get to meet you in real life, Raina. I'm super excited. Yes, yes. yes Sarah will be there. So it's um, the Premier Education Technology Conference in New England. It is back in person this year. Gillette so Stadium. Yep, 2022 at Gillette Stadium. It's October 19th and 20th. So if you're attending that, come seek both of us out. Um, and did you miss any of tonight's links? Don't panic. Once again, we will post them all in the comments tomorrow on our Edpuzzle YouTube channel. So make sure you've subscribed to our channel to get notified when all of our videos drop. Okay. Um, inter by the way, International Podcast Day is September 30th. So in honor of that, like I mentioned, we put together a student podcasting starter pack for our audience. It has links to Raina's slides, two blog posts about podcasting in the classroom and a helpful podcasting in the classroom infographic. Speaking of Twitter, we talked about Twitter. Do you follow us? Not only will you keep up with the latest news and updates, but you'll also discover other educators sharing their best ed puzzle practices. We retweet all of these great ideas when we're tweeted at. Okay. Our next live event is scheduled for Thursday, October 13th with podcaster, and author Jake Miller. We're going to discuss app smashing using the educational duct tape mindset. We've got two other great live events to round out 2022, Building Foundational Relationships with Students, featuring Brooklyn Rainey and her book, One Trusted Adult. And in December, we've got Stephanie Howell, Google Innovator, and Tara Ruckman, coach, sharing their experiences and classroom resources with regard to teaching students executive functioning skills. I know that has been a hot topic.
Mm -hmm. um, I believe registration information for Jake's event opens at the close of the show tonight over on our Edpuzzle Twitter account. So you'll want to register for that too. Yes. And we are also proud to announce on behalf of yes. our certification <laughs> team that we're launching a brand new and improved Edpuzzle certified coach course. And for those of you who are already certified coaches, a mini course focusing on recent updates and new features. So if you were interested in that student project, I'm sure that is featured as one of our new features. We'll add the links to these courses in the show comments, but you'll also see announcements on our social media channels very soon. And as a thank you for being with us tonight and being the self-proclaimed swag queen of Edpuzzle, <laughs> we'd like to offer you all a small token of our appreciation, a gift of Edpuzzle swag. If wow. you can read the form that we're going to add in the comments here, um, we'll send you an Edpuzzle tote bag, stickers, and a postcard. But act fast because this link is going to close at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard time, daylight time. What are we? <laughs> Eastern time. <laughs> Eastern standard, because that's where I am. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and finally, as you all go out into the world implementing the ideas you learned here tonight, we invite you please to share and post your classroom experiences. Tweet at. You should follow Raina. I mean, really, I, I, she's got. I don't think she needs more followers, but follow her because she's got great ideas. Um, use the hashtag at puzzle live. If you're trying out podcasting and again, tag Raina in it so that you, uh, you can share your work, but your fellow educators can learn from your experience. And, and I'm happy to answer any question that anybody has following this, or you want to run something by me because we don't do things in a vacuum. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wish you all a very happy Thursday. Thank you again to our spectacular guest, Dr. Raina Friedman and a super duper shout out to my friends and colleagues, Sarah and Kate for helping to run this event. We will see you next time, everybody. Happy Ed Puzzling. Take care.